Talk to me about belief. Going to what you were just talking about, you have to trust that it's going to work out. Um, you talk about placebo, you talk about the power of belief. What, what is something around that that you think people misunderstand or underutilize maybe? Well, I think in the health space, you know, we're some of the worst at it actually, because we, we arm ourselves with this information. We'll read a book like Wheat Belly and we'll find out all the horrible things that bread do to us. And we might've been eating bread our whole life pretty, and doing it pretty well, but we read a book like that and we're like, oh man, bread is poison. So we tell ourselves bread is poison. And then all of a sudden you have that little bit of grain, you know, like, ah, I'm getting breaking out and everything. And really that's just the mind and the nocebo effect telling us that what we're doing is poison for us. And I think we have to be really mindful that the mind can actually translate information in a lot of different ways and has way more control than we give it credit. And this has been proven hundreds of times over and over again. I know you had Dr. Joe Dispenza on the show and he's one of the leaders in this field. But if you look at the research, everything from breaking out with poison ivy or not breaking out with poison ivy, you know, that's controlled by the mind. You've talked about weaponizing belief, which intoxicates me in a way that I can't explain. <laughs> I find that so interesting. Um, you talked about it in conjunction with Conor McGregor. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by weaponizing belief and how can we employ that? Yeah, I think, you know, we're all really good at detecting each other's belief to a certain degree. And, you know, I, I, we're businessmen. So for us, it's probably going to come in a pitch meeting, right? like, or an employee or something. Like you'll have that person come to pitch you, you'll have that employee come, and they are just so sure, not overcompensating, because that actually is a sign of insecurity, right? But just so calmly sure that they are the right person and they have the right idea, that you may not even get through a quarter of their pitch, because you're like, I'm in. <laughs> like, I, I'm in, you win. Like, I, I believe you 100%. Because you know that, and you can kind of sense that they've reconciled all of their own fears, all their own insecurities, and that they truly believe that they got the goods. And I think that's somebody weaponizing their belief. That's somebody who has done the hard work to really know themselves, know their product, know what's going on. And they're utilizing belief to convince you far, you know, far more than, you know, the documents and everything else. Whereas you can have somebody else with a great idea who's really insecure and not confident and doesn't believe in themselves. And you'll look at it and like, ah, I just don't think it's going to work, you know? And the same can be said for fighters, right? Because fighters, that's a very intimate, belief detection game. I mean, they're right there at the, at the weigh-in staring at each other and they're right there across from the ring. And I think not enough is talked about about actually believing if you're gonna win because I think the other person can detect that as well. So Conor McGregor is someone who believes in himself so much that he comes in at 100% belief and if his, you know, if his opponent is coming in at 99, all of a sudden that 1% difference is gonna be a, a mountain. It's like, wow, he's at 100, like 100% believe? Well, I'm only at 99%. Well, what does he know? Maybe he's right. You know, and so that becomes a weapon for him and has allowed him to be, you know, one of the greatest mixed martial artists in the world. And, and you'll see that kind of across the board. So it's really just using belief to affect reality in a positive way. You've said that practice makes the master. Mm -hmm. The idea of getting to 100% belief is so useful and so powerful. How can people practice? Because I know somebody listening right now, they're thinking, I don't have that belief in myself. Like, I want to come in and do that pitch, or I want to be that kind of fighter, or whatever it is that they're trying to be truly great at. But they don't know how to practice it. They don't know how to cross that chasm. What have you found is usable for practicing belief? Yeah. You know, I talk about this. I actually, one of the first big pieces I wrote is a course called Go For Your Win. And I talk about, a whole, I have a whole chapter on belief and the different forces. And, and to sum that up, um, I think there's a couple things that, that you wanna do. For one, you have to really do the work. Like you have to back it with hard work. You know, and if you ask Conor McGregor, like what's the secret to his success? Hard work, hard work, hard work. I don't know if he actually works harder than anybody, but he believes he does. You know, he has no doubts in his mind that he's actually working harder. And, and that's, I think, important. So really making sure that you really do your best to get the goods, you know, and to, and to practice that and to go out there and put yourself out there. And then on the other side, what is the thing, what is the antagonist of belief? Well, the antagonist of belief is fear. You know, fear is a belief that something negative is going to happen rather than something positive is going to happen. So it's like, that's on the other side. You're almost believing in your failure. Right, rather than believing in your success. So you have to go attack and collapse 
these different fears. And part of that is going to be sucking out the, the penalty if, if you fail, right? Because like a lot of the fear comes because we're afraid that we're going to judge ourselves harshly or whatever. So you got to realize like there is no such thing as failure. There's just learning, right? So you collapse the penalty for failure. So that collapses the fear, which allows you to believe even more. So that's one way to do it. And the other way is to just look at fear itself and play out the different scenarios. Know that you're going to be fine. Again, forgive yourself always. And, and really also just attack fear wherever you see it, even when it's trivial, even when it's some kind of, we were just before, the, before we got on here, we talked about the fear of the number 13, trigotricophobia. Like if you're afraid of 13, you know what you need to do? You need to put 13s all over your house. You know, you need to like sit in 13s, you need to go to the 13th, demand to be on the 13th floor of every hotel and every airplane, because you got to get over that. Because that is telling yourself that there's something irrational that should control you. And if you believe there's something that's irrational that should control you, that will apply universally. So wherever you find fear specifically, that's out of balance with actual danger. Like I'm not saying touch a hot stove or put your hand in a rattlesnake cage. Like there's danger there, that's not fear. But 13, no danger, you know, that's not real. So go collapse that, the fear of crickets like I have or fear of like whatever it is, collapse fear wherever you see it. And that specific collapse will help with the universal collapse of fear in general.